Are you a football agent, an aspiring football agent, or a football finance professional? If so, you should really have a basic understanding of the accounting and tax consequences of agent fees in the world of football. So I'd suggest you keep watching. And if you're interested in more football finance related content, hit the subscribe button. If you like the video, hit like and leave us a comment. It will cost you nothing and would really support this channel and allow us to create more content, which in turn we hope would help you. My name's Neil Wood and this is Football Finance Professionals, the channel that's dedicated to educating you about finance concepts using the medium of football. So what are agent fees? Agent fees or intermediary fees are amounts payable to an intermediary or agent for brokering deals or contracts between players and clubs. And they've come under scrutiny with the BBC recently with a reported unpaid tax bill of up to half a billion pounds. But is it that simple? Agent fees are amounts payable to player and club representatives for negotiating and representing either party or both parties when it comes to the difficult conversation around the transfer and employment contract between a player and the player's club. Now this negotiation could involve the sale and purchase and negotiation of commercial terms from an employment contract length and payment perspective, as well as ongoing support fees when it comes to either the club and or the player. The role is often a multifaceted role with the agent representing the player, the selling club and or the buying club. So from that point of view, things can get quite complex and there may be conflicts of interest. But for now, let's take away the complexities of football and look at some other industries. The concept of an agent in any industry is someone that sits in between at least two parties to negotiate or broker a deal. Let's take commercial property, for example. When buying and selling a commercial property, it's often that the vendor and the buyer would have its own representation. Sometimes, but very rarely, that agent could be the same party. That could cause a conflict of interest because the, the agent may be trying to drive the price up or down depending on who they're looking to save or generate money for. Ultimately, if the agent does a poor job representing its client or clients, then the agent may not have a relationship for very long with one or both of these individuals. And the agency game is very much about relationships. So there may be some short-term visionary agents that which want to broker a deal and get some cash, or ones that want the more long-term relationship with their clients. The thing with commercial property is that the item that's being sold is an inanimate object that doesn't generate a salary on its behalf and doesn't pay any taxes as an individual. That asset will be transferred from the vendor to the buyer the agents representing two separate parties would get their fee and everybody would complete the transaction. Whether the agent is representing more than one party is up to the parties involved. If we look at this in the world of professional services, and let's take finance as an example, it's often that as a finance professional or any other type of profession for that matter, that you could receive a phone call from a recruitment agent asking you if you want to move jobs. And if you engage in that conversation, you could end up moving organizations and the recruitment consultant that brokered that deal would generate some income potentially on their behalf. That fee would be linked to the salary of the person that's being moved into the new role. But it's common that the acquiring company that's employing the services of that professional would pay the fee. It's very unusual that the services of a recruitment consultant would be retained by the individual that is moving. It's not unheard of, but it's quite rare. In the world of football, the agent could sit between multiple parties and that could theoretically be up to three other parties, the selling club, the buying club, and the player. If looking to represent the selling club, the agent's job could theoretically be to drive the value up as much as possible for the transfer fee. If representing the buying club, it could be to get the best deal for the club and potentially drive the fee down. And if representing the player, then the salary of the player is going to be on the agenda of both the agent and the player. And obviously, the higher, the better from their perspective. This is very much simplifying matters and there will be so many other things to consider when it comes to that agent negotiation. It would be unusual to see this type of transaction that would occur between multiple parties with one central person that could be responsible for negotiating this deal on behalf of an asset transfer being the intangible asset that is linked to the transfer fee 
as well as the negotiation of an employment contract and the associated remuneration that comes with that. Where we do have similarities between football and other industries, you could get professionals receiving signing on bonuses or golden handshakes, and that's similar to football players. Whether the agent is being remunerated for that is up to the football player to negotiate with the agent. The challenge to get over in football is whether the player is being represented, whether the club is being represented exclusively, or whether the club is looking to evade or avoid ta paying taxes or potentially a different motivation when it comes to accounting or tax treatment with the specific services that are being procured from the agent. But when it comes to relationships, the agents would often have relationships with both the players and the clubs. To become a successful agent, you would need to be able to match the talent of a player to the requirements of a buying club and also be able to move players on from a selling club at the right price at the right time. But a successful agent that has longevity will be able to prove their worth in these transactions over time. The questions that we need to ask are, do clubs and do players receive value from the agent relationship? And if you ask the parties involved, they would absolutely agree that they do. But who should be paying the fees? If the clubs weren't to get any value from that agent relationship or the agent wasn't doing a very good job, the agent wouldn't last very long. But should the club be paying for these services exclusively or should the player be paying? In any other industry, it would be odd for the professional, being the player in this instance, to be paying a fee to a representative for placing it into a role. It tends to be the acquiring company would pay that recruitment fee. However, it's accepted by HMRC and has historically been accepted that in sport and in football in particular, that there is services that are being provided to both the club and the player. So to move away from that position entirely is going to be quite tricky. If the club and the player have independent agents, i.e. there are two agents involved in that negotiation, then this would be a more simplistic position, but it's often not the case and dual representation will take over. FIFA's new agent regulations prevent an agent from representing both the buying club and the selling club in the same transaction. However, it does recognize and it is allowable that an agent can represent the player and the acquiring club. So that supports the argument that both the club and the player will receive value from this deal. If FIFA, the international football governing body, can allow and accept the concept then there must be merit behind it. But how are these services accounted for in the world of football clubs? We'll refer to services being provided to clubs as club services and services being provided to players as player services under this dual representation contract signed by three parties. From an accounting perspective, if the selling club employs the services of an agent, this is a cost of sale which will be deducted from the proceeds when calculating the profit or loss on disposal of what is a player registration or an intangible asset. When looking at it from an acquiring club's perspective, the agent fee, if one were to be employed, which is almost exclusively always the case, then this is a cost of acquisition from the club's perspective. And what's being acquired is an intangible asset, which is going to be capitalized on the balance sheet. And any costs of acquisition under the accounting standards relating to intangible assets would be capitalizable as part of the cost of acquiring that asset. So a club services fee is capitalized and amortized over the length of the player's contract in a similar way to the transfer fee. The player services element is different. This is a cost of the player and not of the club. However, what complicates matters is that the club often agrees to settle that invoice on behalf of the player. And when we take into account various taxes, it can get quite complicated. This essentially makes up the player's remuneration package and means that the club being billed is being billed for the club and player services if the same agent is being used on that dual representation contract. Since the player services cost is not related to the acquisition of the asset and is linked to the employment contract, it's not an expense that can be capitalized and instead needs to be taken to the profit and loss account as incurred. The tax treatment, again, can be quite complicated. When it comes to VAT, if the agent is registered for VAT, it will add that onto the services for the invoice. From a club's perspective, club services are a club expense. Therefore, the VAT can be reclaimed from HMRC, assuming we're talking about UK VAT, 
as this is a business expense. From a player services perspective, the VAT cannot be reclaimed as part of the VAT return process and must be expensed by the club. Therefore, the gross value then becomes a benefiting kind for the player because the player should have paid that bill if it was to be paying it independently out of its net salary, subject to PAYE and national insurance. But since the player hasn't paid that bill and the club has, then the expense of the agent fee needs to be added to the P11D process and effectively be settled by the player through self-assessment. It's also subject to employer's national insurance as part of the submission to HMRC that is separate to the P11D process. So as you can see, things can get quite complicated between this mix of player and club services, both from an accounting and a tax perspective. It's further complicated by the fact that clubs will receive invoices historically for the same exact amounts, and potentially even on the same invoice with differing VAT and differing accounting treatment from the same agent. And that could lead to simple error, which is why it's important if you're working in a football club to understand the accounting and VAT treatment for specific transactions, because it's very easy to get it wrong. And it could even be a non-finance professional that's tasked with the job of raising purchase orders for agent fees, that doesn't even understand the consequences, and rightly so, doesn't necessarily understand from a professional's perspective what the consequences are when it comes to the accounting and VAT or PAYE treatment of an agent fee. But it's vital from a club, player, and agent's perspective that this is all done correctly. HMRC have previously accepted a 50-50 split between club and player services. This guidance has now been superseded and that 50-50 split is no longer accepted. Albeit the clubs may have tended to stay with that 50-50 historical split, it's now sitting with the club and the player to be able to document and prove the services that are being provided by the agent to either party. If the split is different in the eyes of HMRC when looking at any documentary evidence that's contemporaneous and documented by both parties, then this would cause a problem. 100% club services is going to be questioned unless there is separation of representation between the club having one agent and the player having a separate agent, in which case it's difficult to argue. But if there is dual representation with 100% club services and zero player, that will definitely not be accepted because the player is going to receive some value from the agent. But how much of that fee is up to the services that the agent is providing the player in comparison to the services that are being provided to the club? Practically, how do you do this? Call logs, emails, meeting notes, any minutes, making sure that you can understand as an agent, helping your client on their behalf, keeping a log of everything that you've done to add value to both parties. It's a good habit to get into and may seem like a lot of work, but the alternative HMRC investigation is definitely not something that you want to consider. The problem with a lack of accepted split, be it 50-50 or any other split, is that the guidance is then less clear and the emphasis being put on the parties involved to come up with that split. But given the volume of transactions and the volume of invoices that are being processed on behalf of the club or the player, it's very simple for clubs to get this wrong. It's not necessarily a point of tax evasion or tax avoidance, it could simply be of error. There may be other factors that are involved when it comes to FFP treatment as well, because of the differing accounting treatment versus the tax treatment. Obviously, capitalising and spreading the cost of an agent fee over the life of the player's contract is beneficial from an FFP perspective, where generally club services would have beneficial tax outcomes in comparison to player services. Ultimately, agent fees are going to continue. There will be a significant cost associated to the acquisition and sale and negotiation of all players' contracts, especially in the world of football, where the amount of money continually increases. So it's important for clubs and professionals working within the industry to be well educated, to be aware and to ask questions. It's much better to be upfront with your lack of knowledge than to assume no knowledge on the other end. As a finance professional working in the industry, you might not be a tax expert, but you need to understand the key themes. 
And this is something that we go into depth on when it comes to the professional certificate in football finance. So if you are a professional working in the football industry, why not head over to www.footballfinancepro.com. Check out the professional certificate in football finance, brought to you in collaboration with Loughborough University, the best sports educational institution in the world. We're here to help you. We recognize the problems that exist within football. We have first-hand experience in that area and we want to help you and the industry to improve. So why not reach out? If you like the video, hit like, share it with your friends and leave us a comment. I can't tell you how much it would help us to support our channel and to improve the work that we're trying to do and ultimately to benefit you as a subscriber. So please, if you're interested in this topic, please subscribe or follow us on one of your preferred social media platforms. My name's Neil Wood and I'm a football finance professional. Thanks for watching.